So I'm so glad to have everyone here today. Um, I don't want to get this this wrong, but I, I think this is either our third or fourth year OHD participating in Safe Plus Sound Week. Um, and of course, I was participating in, even before then out in industry and just a really big fan of everything that OSHA, NIOSH, AHA, ASSP, all those organizations put into this event. And I'm sure all of you are. Um, I'm joined today by OHD's new marketing manager, uh, Laura Flowers. Hey, everybody. She'll be monitoring the chat for me. So you can drop any questions in there. And please do utilize the chat as opposed to the question and answers box. Um, I'm sure Laura is very capable of monitoring two little boxes, but uh, let's just make it easier on ourselves. <laughs> so I'm Stephanie Lynch. I'm the Senior Technology and Research Manager here at OHD. And OHD, we are a company out of Birmingham, Alabama. We manufacture and sell the QuantiFit 2 control negative pressure method of respirator fit testing, uh, as well as some uh, other industrial hygiene instrumentation. So air monitoring, noise monitoring. We're the proud distributor of Gillian air monitoring instrumentation, and then also Svantec noise monitoring instrumentation. Uh, please visit our website for all of our wonderful offerings. Okay, so I really want to start at the beginning, especially because considering this is for Safe Plus Sound, we really want to start and get anyone uh, updated if they don't really know much about respirator fit testing. So what is a fit test? A fit test is going to be the use of a series of exercises that a wearer is going to perform uh, to evaluate the, the ability of that respirator to form a snug seal to that specific wearer's face. So to have a good uh, successful fit test, you wanna make sure that you're offering you know, a selection of respirators, a selection of sizes. There's no one respirator, even with its um, you know, set of sizes, that's going to fit every single person um, you know, on the planet, but like, but even smaller, smaller than that, right? But so that fit test is going to have two really important functions for you as a respiratory fit test administrator or as a safety professional for what you need to know. It's going to have the ability to verify that that worker knows how to use their respirator, which is very important. And then it is going to make sure that that specific respirator is capable of providing that fit to that specific wearer. So they will have already established that that respirator is comfortable um, and you know, already been trained on its use. So how to use their respirator, um, how to maintain their respirator and what they're using it to protect themselves against. That's all part of the more comprehensive respiratory protection program. So fit testing is actually just one, I say small, small, small seems like a bad word for something that can be such a huge undertaking, but it's one small part of your successful Respiratory protection program. Okay, there are two overarching types of respirator fit testing. There's qualitative respirator fit testing uh, and quantitative. So qualitative respirator fit testing is a subjective test where you are challenging the seal of a respirator with something that the wearer can either taste or smell or react to. And the current typical methods, at least according to, to OSHA, the current methods are the isoamyl acetate, which is banana oil. And so that's one that you're gonna smell. Then there's saccharin and bitrex, and those are ones you're gonna taste. And so saccharin has a very sweet taste and bitrex is bitter. And then irritant smoke is the last one. And that's gonna be the one that you're actually gonna have a, a reaction to. So it is a it is an actual toxin. So not actually recommended by NIOSH to use because it is a toxin. And you can only use it when you have um, filters that are uh, capable of filtering out that irritant smoke as a toxin. Um, the most common ones you'll see are the saccharin and the bitrex. Uh, I, for years when I worked at UAB Hospital here in Birmingham, used saccharin to fit test 2,500 probably employees. And I tasted saccharin on everything that I ate for, for years. <laughs> um, but another kind of interesting thing. So the way that the qualitative test works is if you do sense that test agent, whatever it may be inside the respirator, then the fit, you're, you're, you failed the test. That fit is not adequate. Um, 
It's only going to be used on those masks that require a 100 fit factor. Uh, so that's going to be your half mask and below. So all those disposable respirators, your N95s, all the way up to your P100s. Um, but one interesting thing about qualitative, when I was doing that saccharin test for 2,500 employees at the hospital, I had a very, very, very low failure rate. And I realize now that I was not a particularly experienced fit tester and that most of those people really just wanted to get back to work. And they knew that they had to pass the test to get back to work. So on this slide, you'll see that line that says, you know, it's subject to cheating. I hate to use that word because it's not like I think that anyone is, is really trying to, to cheat. And maybe the pandemic has had the, the effect of um, improving wearers' awareness of what the real hazard is and then therefore the benefit of the testing. So maybe you're not seeing that as much, particularly in hospital workers, unfortunately, because of what was likely their experience with the pandemic, right? But so some of the benefits of qualitative fit testing are that it is inexpensive, uh, relatively, and then it's going to have very low maintenance requirements. You really just have to kind of clean your hood, um, clean out the equipment you're using, a um, little bit of buying some extra things, you know, when you run a solution, you have to pick up, stuff like that. But it is imprecise, it's subjective, you're relying on that wearer. Another side note, sort of pandemic peripheral is that if you are relying on one of the agents that you're supposed to be able to smell or taste, then, you know, COVID had the side effect of eliminating some people's taste and smell. And some people are, uh, you know, still contracting COVID. And also some people are experiencing sort of long-term mm -hmm. symptoms. Not a lot of people, but just something to be aware of. Uh, and I mentioned the sort of subject to cheating. Again, don't love to use that word. I think people generally want to do the right thing. And then it is slow. So that protocol, that approved series of exercises that you're going to see within the OSHA standard uh, is longer for the qualitative testing than for the quantitative testing, which we'll jump into now, quantitative methods. So quantitative fit testing, you know, as if we couldn't make it confusing enough, you know, qualitative, quantitative, they clearly sound very similar. And then we talk about quantitative methods We'll get into a slide about this, but the two most common methods are called C and P and C and C. So very easy to, to confuse, right? Um, we're we're going to try to iron that out. So a quantitative fit test is going to use a machine to actually measure in some way what is leaking into the mask. There are three methods that are accepted by OSHA. I'm, of course, going to list ours first, control negative pressure, OHD's um, patented respirator fit test. And then CNC, which I just mentioned, so that's ambient aerosol, condensation, nuclei counting. Um, some other places you'll hear it, uh, ambient particle counting. But it's going to provide a, an actual number that quantifies that fit. And so that number is called a fit factor. So quantitative fit testing, some, some method can be used on any type fitting respirator. As a little asterisk there, controlled negative pressure is not able to be used on those filtering face piece respirators. So those um, disposable uh, one use masks, so the N95s up to the P100s that you probably become more familiar with um, because of the pandemic. Again, okay, so the benefits of quantitative fit testing are that it's going to be, it's going to have that precision. It's using an instrument to actually measure leakage, it's going to be objective. It's gonna have a form of automated documentation, no matter what method you're using. Uh, I actually didn't mention on the last slide about the generated aerosol, um, but generated aerosol is an available method, but it's not commonly seen. It's usually only used in labs. And then also um, some branches of the military have a portable um, generated aerosol thing that they use, the JSMLT, if you've ever heard of it. Uh, I hope for your sake that you haven't, because it's a very, uh, clunky, cumbersome <laughs> instrument, but that's beside the point. So you're going to have that automated documentation. And as I mentioned, with the qualitative protocols being longer, the quantitative protocols are going to be much faster. So, um, you know, there are methods, there are protocols for all of the methods that are much shorter um, than the ones required for qualitative. On the downside, it is relatively much more expensive than the qualitative respirator fit testing. And it does require maintenance. And that maintenance is typically at least an annual calibration. Okay, 
So these are the two more common methods of quantitative fit testing. I mentioned that the, <laughs> the acronyms are a bit confusing. CNP, controlled negative pressure, and CNC, condensation, nuclei counting, or ambient aerosol. When we talk about CNP, that's OHD's instruments, so QuantiFit, QuantiFit 2. We use air as our challenge agent, so we're directly measuring the amount of air in cc's per minute that is going to leak into the respirator. With ambient aerosol, you're using ambient aerosols in the air to use to challenge the respirator. And that's essentially you're somehow getting behind the respirator, either with an adapter in your mask or um, uh, probing it, actually putting a hole in the respirator, and you're measuring the amount of aerosol, ambient aerosol that you find inside the mask. You're comparing it to the amount of ambient aerosol you're finding outside of the mask. If you're in a place that doesn't have a lot of ambient aerosols, so if you're in a, a really clean space, then you can artificially create that. And I'm gonna go more in depth into to CMP just because that's that's what my specialty is. Uh, so I won't you know bore you here to do it twice. But <laughs> so when are you going to perform a fit test? So whenever you're picking out respirators for a respiratory hazard that exists in your workplace, you're gonna go ahead and perform fit testing to get all of your people into those those respirators initially. So you're going to perform it initially. And then you're also going to do it if you're ever in the situation where you realize that you're using respirators and they haven't been fit tested. So I am seeing that less and less, although I did see some, yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm mentioning the, the pandemic lot. This, this also happened where we had customers go, we need our people to come into work. So we're going to give them N95 respirators and then they'll be able to come to work and we're all good, right? Um, no, that's not right. <laughs> we mentioned if you're gonna have respirators, you have they have to be part of a respiratory protection program. So there's a lot of issues with just giving everyone N95s to get them to come to work because you're acknowledging COVID as an occupational hazard that then you're providing protection against. And then you're gonna have to implement fit testing. It's just logistically a lot more than just handing out N95 respirators, right? So, but if you do ever come into the unfortunate um, situation of identifying that there are respirators being used against an occupational hazard and they have not been fit tested, then you would want to go ahead and do fit testing. So initially or anytime you find that they haven't been fit tested. Okay, talking about when to redo a fit test. OSHA is going to have you do it annually. And I imagine most of us are, are OSHA. This is an, kind of an OSHA event. But if it's not, then there will be typically a regulated time interval based on whatever regulation you're following or standard you're following. You also want to do it if a wearer either loses or gains significant weight. Um, and I always say this, but like, good luck to you if you are the person who wants to go up to one of your colleagues and say they seem to have gained 20 pounds. <laughs> um, but that's where... That's where you want to rely on having a good culture and having a good relationship with your employees. If you have a good relationship with your employees, then they're going to be the one who's going to go, oh, you know what? Um, I, I knew this from my training. I feel like I've either had a significant weight change or I know I'm going to get that dental work. I better go ahead and sign up to get my new fit test, right? So any facial changes or um, anything that's going to make it where it's impacting where that respirator seals, right? Okay, who is going to perform your fit test? This is sort of an emerging issue in, in my opinion, because OSHA uses very wishy-washy wishy language, saying that that person needs to be qualified and they need to be competent. Uh, and so like those feel a bit subjective. And there's no course outlined by OSHA, at least, that says, okay, if you complete this course, then you are both qualified or competent. That being said, all over the world, they are coming out with more and more sort of fit tester uh, accreditation schemes. And so those are tests that you can actually go through to become certified, maybe is the, is the right word. I'm sure different places use different words. We do have programs like that in the US. They're not required, but they are available. So if you are that person who is responsible for the respirator fit testing and you feel like maybe you would like to learn more and make sure you do feel very 
confident and comfortable with fit testing everyone, uh, there are courses available. And then know that it's kind of other schemes emerging. So there's one called Fit to Fit that's sort of spreading across Europe right now. There's one called Rest Fit, and that's in Australia. Um, I'm, a, I'm a proud assessor for that program for CNP. And then there's Commit to Fit also, and I think that one's out of New Zealand, but you get my point. Accreditation schemes, kind of an emerging issue. I think we'll see more of them moving forward. Okay, all of that being said, why are we fit testing? So I'm sure that all of us, because we're participating in Safe Plus Sound, are performing our fit tests because we really care about the health and wellness of our employees, right? But we also want to verify that training. I mentioned that that can be a real benefit of fit testing. You are also doing this thing where you're providing your employees with a sense of control over, um, over their situation and their health and their protection level. So when you do that fit test, uh, you're letting that employee see like, hey, look, this is how well your respirator is fitting you. If you have the time, you can even um, you know, go through multiple fit tests. I know time is, <laughs> time is very valuable and probably most of us don't have it. But if you do, then you really can you know, show that maybe there's a different way to adjust the respirator to get a better fit. You know, with that fit factor, you can't do that as much with qualitative, but you see the idea. And of course we do it because we're regulated to do so. So OSHA here in the US is gonna require it. Uh, it's in ANSI, it's in ISO. Um, this is another, you know, regulation is also kind of working its way around the world. So we're seeing more and more respirator. Well, there is stuff emerging about respirator fit testing specifically, but a lot of this regulation is coming out of the development of respiratory protection programs, those being regulated, um, you know, around the world. So we've seen manufacturing spread and slowly but surely behind it, safety is kind of clawing its way into the picture. Uh, once people realize that um, maybe they do want their employees to, to live a healthy life and be productive members of their workforce, which you would think would be very intuitive, but. Um, I'm gonna stop you for a couple of questions here okay. um, related to CNP. I know you're about to get into it, um, but um, specifically, um, does the CNP adapter fit onto each person's personal respirator face piece? Yes. Yes. I knew the answer to that <laughs> one. Hey. That's the one I knew. <laughs> so yes. Um, and we'll we'll talk about that now. Um the way that you're going to do a control negative pressure fit test, that's our quantifit two, uh, is our newest iteration of CNP, newest instrument. But it you have adapters that secure onto the mask the same way your filter does. And so you can use it on that person's specific mask uh, to be able to, to challenge that respirator and they can get a really good feel for, for how it fits. That's great. Um, and I think the next one you'll get into, but um, what is the minimum amount of time a fit test will take using the OHD CMP or quantum Ooh, two? The, I mean, the minimum amount of time is less than a minute. Um, I mean, the maximum amount of time is maybe two and a half minutes. If you had someone who um, maybe isn't as as familiar with putting on their their respirator, um, so, so yeah. Um, specifically, this was his question. Joseph's question was surrounding uh, the concern that the expectation that this process needs to be done quickly, which can lead to improper fit testing. Oh, I mean, improper fit testing is kind of. Maybe I didn't even phrase that really well talking about these assessor schemes. I mean, um, yeah, but for, for the things to, to certify you as a fit tester, but we have a lot of people, I'm so excited to use this phrase, <laughs> but we have so many people who instead of fit testing, what are they doing, Laura? They're fit passing. Fit passing. They're fit passing. And we don't, we don't want to fit pass. So I agree with you. Now, the time that it takes to do a test, I don't think is maybe the biggest issue. You're going to find with both CNP and CNC, it can be a very quick, quick test. Um, but it is about proper administration of that test, right? So um, having an assessor who's able to recognize the limitations of the type of technology that they're working with, as well as the benefits, um, not doing things that might inflate a fit factor's value um, and I can only think of an example with, with CNC at the moment, but it's just, you're, you know, if you have the particle counter right next to the instrument, well, uh, any of those manufacturers will tell you don't, don't, I mean, the particle generator right next to the instrument. Anyone would tell you don't, don't do that, but people don't know because they've not actually read the manual. I'm sure there's tons of stuff that happens with CNP, um, but 
yeah, being properly trained to perform the test effectively is as important, if not much more important than the timing that the test takes. But once you start a test, you know, they are kind of, so with CNC, it's gonna be a set amount of time. Uh, you know, if something goes wrong in the test, then you, you, you kind of have to abort that test and, and start over. CMP, uh, the thing that's gonna hold you up is when you get to uh, the read-on, right? Mm -hmm. If someone's not as familiar with their mask, and we'll talk, we'll talk about that in the read-on protocol, but if someone doesn't know how to don their mask well, that's something you probably need to train them on. But it can just mean that maybe they're a little slower at getting it put on and getting adjusted. So that can kind of hold up a little bit of time. Okay, I can't remember. I feel like I covered this slide pretty well. I'm talking about of it. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. overall. Okay, so we're measuring the leak rate. We're determining the actual amount of air in cc's per minute leaking into the respirator. And uh, we'll talk about how the uh, fit factor is actually calculated a bit later. So the way that CMP works is you have your two adapters that have put onto your specific mask, and we have adapters for, for almost all available respirators. There's been a big, uh, you know, kind of explosion of new respirators on the market, but we're, we're keeping up as best we can. And every new one we find about, we, we make adapter for it. So one side, the single side blue tube is going to actually seal off that, that respirator so that the user can take a breath and hold it. Once the user takes its breath and holds it, the um, machine, this is an advancement with the QuantaFit 2, in case you're familiar with our older instrument, legacy instrument, the QuantaFit, it's gonna automatically sense that breath hold, and then it's gonna start the test. So that dual tube side is then going to be measuring the actual air that's leaking into the respirator, uh, and then it's going to be controlling, so it sets a controlled negative pressure, and by evacuating any air that leaks in, it maintains that controlled negative pressure. And that pressure is associated with a, a breathing rate. So it's if you kind of think about it, a good way to think about it is the total air that's being inhaled, and then the comparison there is the amount of contaminated air that's leaking in. And that's how we end up doing our, our fit factor, which we'll talk about. So this is what we're talking about when we say that breathing rate. So that breathing rate, when we set that challenge pressure, that control negative pressure within the respirator, that's associated with that breathing rate. And so you think of someone like if they could continuously inhale for eight seconds, which of course, you know, they can't, which is why we set it in there, but you continuously inhale for, for eight seconds, what would that total inhale be uh, over what amount of contaminated air has leaked in? So that, that leak air. That's what's come in around the filters, right? So that's how we do our, our fit factor. And that's one thing that you'll see is very different between the methods. This is just looking at it a little bit, just so you can see some of the math. Um, you know, our technology, the way that we do the fit factor is maybe a little less well understood than the um, CNC method. So we take that leak rate, and I did this here just to, to make the math easy. But so I took our breathing rate that's from our um, read-on protocol, and then so it's a, a moderate work rate for so someone who's working moderately hard. So that's another benefit to using a breathing rate is that the person is going to be able to uh, just sit there comfortably, but the machine itself is creating a more challenging breathing rate. So we have that 53,800 cc's per minute which is 53.8 liters per minute. We only express it in liters per minute because we wouldn't want to continuously talk about the you know, thousands of cc's per minute. And then over our one cc of um, leakage per minute, and we change that into our, you know, we wouldn't want to talk about it in thousands of liters per minute. So that's why we use those units, but that would give you that 1000 fit factor. And so that's what you would see on the machine for that individual exercise. So if you're familiar with CNC testing, what they're gonna do is look at the number of particles that they find uh, in the ambient air, and they're gonna put that over the number of particles that they count inside the respirator. And that's how they get their fit factor for that specific exercise. And the difference there is that you could see how both of those would have ranges. So in the way that CNP's fit factor is calculated, that model breathing rate is, is a set value. Whereas when you talk about the amount of particles you could find in a space, 
that kind of, that can go pretty high. And so you can see a range of fit factors going from you know zero to over a hundred thousand. But with C and P, our range is much more limited. It's only going to go with that read-on protocol, uh, which is the one you'll see in OSHA. Um, it would only the highest fit factor you'd ever see would be at twenty six thousand nine hundred, uh, and that would be with a respirator perfectly sealed to someone's face, which we know is is pretty impractical. I wish we could expect that from respirator, but once both of those methods <laughs> figure out their individual exercise fit factors in their very different ways, then both methods do a harmonic mean to figure out the overall fit factor. And so that's going to be um, your total number of exercises, whether it's you know four or five. Uh, and you can just see this is how you calculate the overall fit factor. And the benefit of doing that harmonic mean is that it is going to place greater weight on the lower values. And so that's a way for fit factors to be more conservative in their evaluation of fit, which is, which is very good. So it's going to help lower the impact of any sort of large outliers. Um, and so, yeah, it's going to make it where those lower values carry more weight. And just an example of that is if you were to add up these numbers and do just a just an average, just get the mean, then uh, you would get a 1,000. But when you do it as a harmonic mean, you get the value of 862. So when you're looking at an overall fit factor, you would get an 862. So that's going to make it you know a little bit lower, a little bit more conservative in um, how it's evaluating that wearer's fit. So as far as our instruments of CMP and just some of the benefits that you can see with our equipment, um, since we are the kind of less well-known uh, method, we do have battery power. So one of the benefits of CMP is that you can perform a fit test actually outside. You're not going to be able to do that with CNC um, because of the particle requirements. We have Bluetooth capability. We've got a colored touchscreen. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, CNC methods also have a, a color touchscreen available. But we have that auto start feature. Um, we have on-screen signature capture. So essentially, if you have a uh, you know a stylus, you'll be able to do entirely touch-free testing, which can be be nice in some situations. We have software. All all, all methods have have software, and then. We have the ability to perform multiple tests uh, all at once. So you could oversee theoretically multiple instruments running multiple tests, and it would alert you um, if anyone had an issue, you know, a failure on staff or whatever. It's actually kind of another benefit of CNP. I mentioned earlier that CNC, if something goes wrong in, in the test, you either have to abort the test and start over, or you have to let it finish to see if maybe you're going to end up coming out with a with an overall pass. Uh, and with CNP, you're going to be able to actually retest the step. So if someone does, you know, uh, stop holding their breath for, for a second or um, just does something that's not related to the actual fit of the respirator, then you'd be able to just redo that step real quickly. So our battery, we've got batteries that really improve the portability of the instrument. You're able to um, just get an optional battery pack. It's going to run for more than four hours. I've actually if you're not even doing continuous testing, which normally you're not, or at least normally I'm not, then uh, it can run well over the entire day. And um, yeah, you can take your instrument anyway. So if you have multiple sites, you'd be able to, to take the QuantiFit2 around with you, um, hopefully improving your, your fit testing experience. <laughs> I know that um, fit testing is not always the most thrilling thing that you could ever be doing with your time, but. I mentioned that LED touch screen. These are some examples of the avatars that we have. Um, we've got our military one on the top. The one in the middle is actually the one from our UK protocols. And then the one on the bottom is our, is our uh, read-on protocol avatar. All of the things that we did with QuantiFit2, anything that had to do with its development was um, sort of pre- COVID decided and then very like reactionary with anything that maybe happened with COVID to just ensure that we had the, the best test experience that we possibly could for CMP for all of our customers. But one thing that we really got to actually develop because of COVID and people's concerns were these pure adapters. So previously we had um, aluminum uh, adapters. We do still have those available, but aluminum adapters that people felt like 
it wasn't easy to disinfect them and they didn't feel confident in their ability. So we introduced pure adapters and they are just, they're essentially designed to be disinfected. So they can be completely disassembled. And then you can also place a 95% uh, efficiency filter into that adapter to ensure that no contaminated air is ever entering into any of your tubes. Um, now that's not, not really a concern for CNP because of how the test is run, but it's kind of a perception issue, right? Uh, if you want to really show that you are between each test, making every effort to prevent any kind of cross-contamination and wiping off your machine, doing touchless testing, then this is just another thing that you can add to that sort of toolbox of, um, you know, what are we doing to protect you in the fit test, in the administration of your, of your fit test. So something to be aware of and something kind of cool that came out. Okay. Another thing that I want to show just because we've talked about a lot of different protocols and what that really means is that read-on protocol that's in OSHA. So for the read-on protocol in OSHA currently, you're going to have steps one and two, so facing forward and bending over, and they're going to have a 30-second um, wait period. Um, I will say that uh, there is reason to believe that moving forward, those 30-second wait periods are going to be be removed and we're really excited about that. But, so you're gonna take that 30 seconds and then you're gonna do our 10 second um, measurement. And so it's an eight, it's a 10 second sort of test step because you have to take your breath, hold it, and the machine runs for eight seconds and then you have to you know, release your breath. So that's step one, step two. Step three, if you're not familiar with our, our test protocol is a little bit weird because you're gonna shake your head very forcefully uh, and exhale um, forcefully. And that's testing the ability of that respirator to reseat after, you know, some sort of knocking or bumping or whatever. I guess I should have talked about the, the benefits. Of, so the facing forward exercise, the benefit there is just, you know, that's how most of your breaths are going to be. You're, you're just going to be in kind of a normal position. The bending over is to, to test the impact of gravity on that respirator fit. The third step, that head shaking is, is you know, the ability of the respirator to reseat. And then our fourth and fifth step are both actual read-ons, which means you're taking the mask completely off and you're putting the mask completely back on. And that's testing the ability of your wearers, your respirator wearers, to consistently and repeatedly uh, effectively don their respirators. So every single fit test, every single read-on fit test has three donnings. Um, so you're really getting to see that that user is comfortable with their respirator, knows how to put it on well, and consistently get that, that fit. So as our little part, just because a lot of people haven't seen, you know, and if we were all in person, it'd be great to just be able to give this demonstration in, in person, but I wanted to walk through that read-on protocol. So this is actually uh, Luke Allen. He's uh, the president of OHD. Uh, and so what he's gonna do is he's gonna go ahead and get his respirator donned, uh, make sure he's got it adjusted appropriately to where he feels like he has a good fit. Then he's going to, um, I mentioned with the OSHA protocol, but please do reference your standard because those 30 seconds don't exist in every standard. Um, they're not in, in Canada. They're not in um, the ANSI protocol. Um, so OSHA introduced those and, and we're working with them to get that corrected. But Luke's going to take his breath. He's going to hold it. The test is going to automatically start. It's going to run for those eight seconds. He's going to move into the second step of the read-on protocol. So he's bending over and, you know, testing, make sure that gravity is not going to pull that mask off of his face. And so same thing. He's going to wait for a second. Then he's going to take that breath and hold it. Uh, test is again going to run for those eight seconds. Uh, and of course, Luke does, you know, a ton of fit tests all the time. So he's really good with how his mask fits him. This is that third step that I mentioned is a little bit weird, but he's shaking his head. And he's either forcefully exhaling or he's shouting um, or he's talking uh, to just make sure that after all of that, that respirator is able to reseat to his face and he runs through the step. Now, I mentioned, but this is really that true benefit of the read-on protocol. He is taking his mask entirely off and then he is putting it all the way back on, redoing those straps, readjusting it to his face um, to make sure that your wearers, your respirator wearers, do know how to put on their respirator appropriately and get a good seal uh, repeatedly. Because that's one thing that is, you know, you always wonder about. So sure, it fit me during the fit test, right? But am I able to get a fit over and over again? 
So read on protocol absolutely helps with that. So then fifth step, exactly the same as the fourth. He takes the respirator entirely off. He puts the respirator all the way back on, takes his breath, holds it. The machine knows he's done it. So he's just running through that test. So someone asked about test timing. This is pretty reflective. Uh, keep in mind that probably wasn't a full 30 seconds for the first and second step. And if you are following OSHA, then you're going to have that 30 seconds on your first and second step. Um, so you can see the test might have been a few seconds longer. But that's really representative of how long that test is. Okay. Do we have any questions? We sure do. Uh, well, here's some interesting ones. Um, just some general housekeeping ones. Will continuing education credits be offered for today's presentation? Uh, I don't think I so, don't no. I don't think so. Um, just making sure. <laughs> we, can, uh, we can send you something that we says can, you attended. Yeah, but, um, we'll send you something that says you attended. We will send you the recording of the webinar. Um, and I am getting that question more and more. So maybe you and I will do some research into what that actually entails to get, yeah. those, get those credits. I know I need those to maintain my certifications. So you think I can give them to myself? Sure. Yeah, you can do it. I was you definitely want. here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so one question, um, how do you handle testing in a room that is relatively clean and the machine will not calibrate to test employees? What methods are recommended to, you know, ensure that improve, you know, and if you're talking, I mean, I would assume you're talking about C and C in that instance, if you're so. in a very clean room, um, if you're in a very clean room and you're using C and C, you would absolutely have to get a particle generator. You have to generate particles into that room until you got a count that was high enough uh, to perform the fit testing. Cool. Um, is there a benefit to an outside versus an inside test or warm weather versus cool weather? Uh, no benefit as far as the fit test is concerned. I mean, as far as your wearer's comfort, you know, in Alabama right now, it is 90 degrees outside. So maybe this wouldn't be the best time to run your uh, fit test program outside, but <laughs> but um, if you're good, but yeah, you're good. Um, and then, can you speak to the accuracy of CNP compared to other techniques? Oh, uh, can I, I? I sure can speak to it, but I don't want to come off as like too incredibly biased. I, I am, I am biased, and I think that CNP is is the most accurate method um, because we are measuring air, which is in like, you know, the septillions of molecules around us. Uh, it's a very, it's a very challenging test. So when we detect leakage and we quantify it, um, we're really challenging that respirator. With other methods, you're having to rely on some things like particle mi migration, uh, make sure they're getting to the probe to get counted. Uh, and there's just a lot of other stuff that can impact impact that, that I feel like CNP avoids. And in my opinion, my humble opinion, makes it more accurate. <laughs> I like that. Um, some people have difficulty holding their breath in a way that is compatible with the CNP test. I guess that's like the... Yes. Um, so if you do have users who are struggling to hold their breath, I would say that you kind of have some issues at that point with whether they are like qualified to be in a respirator because theoretically, if you're running your respiratory protection program appropriately, then everywhere needs to be able to do uh, a negative pressure user seal check, which would be taking that breath and holding it. So you cover your, your filters, take breath and hold it. And you're supposed to do that for 10 seconds. So I would, I would say if you do have a user who's, who's struggling with holding their breath specifically. Um, now, if you're talking about, you know, the type of breath that you, you want to take, you should be able to get, you know, just a sharp breath, take it and hold it and the machine should run. But if you are struggling with just that aspect of it, you can override the auto start and you can just force the machine to do a manual start. And then it won't, it won't matter how the user's taken their, their breath as long as they're holding it. But um, I don't know if that was helpful. Mm -hmm. I have had some people for some reason that it helps them to just place a hand on a table to be able to take their breath. Like there's something about feeling weird. Another thing is just from all the years that I've done CNP fit testing, um, some people kind of like freak out for a second and think that maybe they, they can't breathe. So one thing that I get them to do is, you know, take your breath, hold it and say, okay, now breathe. And it's going to abort the test. Right. But then the user understands that the machine's not like, not like stealing your breath from you or something. Right. So, uh, 
sometimes it's an educational pump. Um, I have had a few people, so like I said, putting the hand on the table, I've had other people who sometimes it helps to put their hand on their chest uh, to be able to hold hold their breath appropriately. Um, I don't, ho hopefully that's helpful. Mm -hmm. if, if you have any further questions about it, reach out to me offline and um, I'll do what I can to help you. Sure, I think the other question related to that was how do you determine if someone is physically fit enough to wear a respirator? Oh, so that, that comes with, you know, a medical evaluation, which is required by OSHA. So, um, you absolutely want to put them through a medical evaluation. I am not that kind of doctor, uh, but they are all over the place. Occupational health clinics can can hook you up, and I'm sure there are services that are even specific to uh, respirator fit testing. That's great. Um, one more question: How many attempts at each test are allowed before a fit test is considered a failure? So I'm going to assume a little bit that that's related to the CMP and um, redoing a step. Uh, I. I don't think there's some like set number of times where it's regulated that you can't do it. But uh, me as a fit test administrator, it just depends on what is happening in the test. So with CMP, you're clearly having to worry about a couple more individual uh, like issues with the actual person, right? Because we just talked about that breath holdability or whatever. So is that failure because someone is struggling so is it, okay, first question, is this the first step? So if this is the first step and someone's struggling, then I'm going to work with them maybe on their breath holding issue. If it's the first step and it seems like it's related to fit and I'm going, wow, it's a very large, large leak. Um, this is related to fit. Then I'm going to work with them again. I'm going to, we're going to step back from testing and we're going to go, okay, uh, how do we have our mask, you know, adjusted? How are you feeling? Let, you know, walk through stuff like that. And then we're going to restart the test. Now, if it's on the third step, and it's related to uh, just them holding their breath. I'll let them do a retry. If they do it again and it's still just related to breath, maybe I would do one more retry. At that point, I would go, okay, we've tried two times. Something else is going on here. Let's restart. Now, this is, again, very personal. But if it's related to fits, or if you're on the third step and they just start failing drastically, to me, that test has failed. That means that the mask was able to get unseated and not reseat, and now that mask is not fitting them well. And that was based on how they put it on, right? So to me, that it, is that kind of is that yeah. clear as mud? Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> it's, it's, okay. It makes sense to me. So it's probably okay. Sense okay. That people who know more than me about this. Oh yeah, somebody said once we fail several times, we will try another size. Yeah, which makes sense. Yeah. Right. Try another size. Try another model. If you're yeah. Um, I think that is it for the questions. Any more questions? We'll give it going once. <laughs> oh. So there is no cross contamination using the same adapter between people. Um, right. Yes. Yeah. That's a correct statement. <laughs> All right. No, this is good. Uh, so this is my contact information up on the screen. And I'm sure we'll send it out also with the um, webinar recording and uh, all that stuff, and do feel free to reach out to me by email. Um, and I thank you all for your time, and I hope you have a really good rest of your safe plus sound week. Um, and I hope your company's doing something fun for all of you guys. Thanks, everyone.